Hi, this is Dr. Janet Krell. I'm in the Academy of Medical Educators, as well as the Department of Internal Medicine at the University of Colorado School of Medicine. This webinar is looking at three types of active learning and how they might apply in health professions education. We're going to specifically focus on defining active learning and then walking through a few applications within broader higher education. We're then going to narrow down and focus on three specific strategies of active learning before we move into making you successful, including on what to do and what to avoid when bringing active learning into your teaching in health professions. So let's start by setting a definition. Active learning is anything that involves our students doing things and thinking about the things that they are doing. There are many forms of active learning. So when we talk about doing things and thinking about things, we're going to look at the strategies that you see in the top row here, such as pausing the lecture, having the students take notes, discuss what was presented, or even inquiring with the students, whether that's using a polling tool or giving them some sort of problem to work through. This session is not going to discuss flipped classroom or team-based learning, but those two have elements of active learning in them. So let's focus on these three easy ways, starting with the pause. The pause looks like this. You're gonna to talk to the class for five to eight minutes, usually conveying two to three key points that they need to take home. You're then gonna pause. In this time, you're gonna give the students a clear direction. Are they to reflect on what you said? Are they to write or review notes? Or should they turn to the people around them and check their understanding? The evidence that this approach is effective has been published since 1977 and onwards. One of those studies I'm gonna focus on looked at a randomized control approach with 72 students where with some of the students they paused and with the other group of students they didn't pause. And you'll see in the table below, the short-term recall when they paused immediately after lecture checked the student's short-term recall and saw that the students were able to recall a higher number of facts than the students who were in the no-pause scenario. They also followed up a few weeks later with a knowledge exam. And they, again, the students who were given the lecture scenario where they got to pause, dialogue with peers, or just reflect or just take notes, scored better on the exam than students who did not have that opportunity in lecture. So why does this work? Well, it turns out the human attention span is short. And so working with pausing every five to 15 minutes and giving people a chance to consolidate the information is quite important. We're gonna also bring in the rule of seven here, which is people can remember seven plus or minus two chunks of information. It's arguable that maybe it's even fewer chunks of information, but the point being here that if we're pausing every five to 15 minutes, we're chunking the information for the learners, we're giving them a chance to consolidate that, and so by the end of a one hour lecture, they have had maybe five chunks that they need to remember, which fits very comfortably in this rule of seven. So what do you need to do to make this work? Well, remember, when you pause, you need to give the students a really clear transition statement. I like to keep a watch or timer available because I get antsy, have I really given them five minutes, and so forth. It's important that you stay quiet. This is their opportunity to consolidate the information. Also, just get a general sense of what the students need from you. Do they need you to wander? So if they want to ask the one-off question, they can do that a bit more quietly, or should you just stay put where you have been giving your talk the whole time? Remember when that pause is over, you need an equally clear transition statement for the learners to know it's time to return to listening to you. Now, if this were a live webinar, here's where I would pause for you to ask questions or clarify any comments. What I encourage you to do now is just take a minute to consolidate what you've heard and jot down any questions that you have. At the end of this presentation, I'll show my email. You'll have a chance to email me with your questions.
I'm now going to transition to the second type of active learning. If you're not ready, pause this recording and then hit play when you're ready to continue. So the second type is called asking a question. This is where you're going to lecture again for five to 15 minutes, but usually try and keep it between five to eight minutes. You're going to pause and start by asking a question to the learners. Remember that that question could be asked using an audience response system, like a clicker system or polling system, or you could pose a question on a slide, reinforce it verbally, and give them the clear instruction that they're to discuss that question with their peers. This question could be an application question, it could be a synthesis question, or it could just be basic knowledge and checking conceptualization. After the pause is over, you're going to follow up with a mini lecture. But here's the key. The mini lecture needs to focus on the correct answer to the question and specifically how the correct way is to conceptualize the problem that you've posed within the question. The goal here is that not only are you giving them a chance to consolidate their knowledge, you're then going to model for them the correct conceptualization of that knowledge synthesis or application. Does this work? Well, yes, the biggest evidence here comes from undergraduate physics. So we'll focus on the Crouch and Missouri 2001 study. Um, in fact, this summarized eight years of undergraduate physics and a learning gain was what they measured. A learning gain is the start of semester exam compared to final end of semester exam score and looking at any sort of gain and difference between those two scores. And what they found over eight years here was that they could get learning gains between 0.49 and 0.74. That's pretty impressive. It tells us that there's a reason to engage this type of tool within our teaching to help our learners consolidate conceptualize correctly and move forward with the knowledge that we're trying to give them. So why does this work? Well, you're correcting the conceptualization of the fundamental principles for the learner, but to some extent you're also allowing collaborative learning, which means you're allowing the learners to dialogue with their peers, which has these other activities or actions or outcomes that happen with our learners, which is they have a perception that there's greater social support for them as a learner as they go through this very complex world of university that can often be very lonely. It therefore, or consequently, improves their academic achievement. Now the key here is that you've gotta have good questions. My tips to you would be make sure that they're clearly worded and developmentally appropriate for the learners that you're working with. So for example, if you're giving questions to residents, have residents of the next year up or the year below pilot those questions and review them for you. Or field test them with your peers. You see here on the side uh, the taxonomy here of, sorry, it's Bloom's taxonomy of the depth of learning that could happen. Lots of our questions that deal with factual recall are at the bottom of the pyramid, and as we move up the pyramid, we're looking at greater depth of learning. If you've given a greater depth of learning, like a case, um, reading any sort of uh, radiolog radiological image, or any sort of complexity to this, you wanna give the learners more time to synthesize, um, digest what's happening, work with their peers, make sure that you're giving them that clear statement of, what you want them to do in the activity. And then my last tip to you is anticipate what the learners are going to say. I always create a little tip sheet for myself of those anticipated responses. So then when different things happen in class and I anticipate, I'm more ready to adapt and pivot in the moment to what's needed to happen in class to support those learners and correct their conceptualization. So here again, I'm gonna pause, give you a chance to summarize that information for yourself, and again, jot down any questions you may have.
I'm now going to transition to the third type of active learning. If you're not ready to move forward, please pause the recording and hit play when you are ready to proceed. The third type is a case or problem. This follows the same format as you've seen previously in examples one and two, but we're going to build on that in that we're going to give a lecture covering the main concepts. We're going to assign a case or a problem where we circulate to provide help and answer questions. We're then going to, just like in example two, answer and debrief, ensuring the correct steps, the correct thinking are happening in our learners, and we're going to model that for them. But here's the catch. In this model, we're going to repeat the first three steps here you see in green several times in the assigned lecture slot. And because we're aiming to build towards mastery, we're going to repeat and increase the difficulty of the case or problem each time we go through. Does this approach work? Well, one of the studies from 1998 looked at introductory physics courses, and you can see that it was traditional lecture compared to when they offered cases, worked problems with immediate feedback. And that immediate feedback is that follow-up mini lecture that you give where you're showing the correct way to solve it and the correct conceptualizations. You'll see that there's a difference in the average learning gain. So when we have given students the chance to work through the problems and give them immediate feedback, we're seeing a much higher learning gain, almost two standard deviations higher than we would when we just lecture. So why does this work? Just like the previous two examples, we're addressing the correct conceptualization for the learners, we're offering some opportunity for collaborative and cooperative learning, so we're increasing that social network. But here's the new key. We're repeating and building upon concepts while also role modeling. In health professions education, when we're doing cases or going through images or uh, diagnostic thinking or even analyzing different lab results, we're simultaneously enculturating our learners into the ways of thinking of professional practice. By repeating and building upon concepts, we're also consolidating the concepts, which increases memory retention. And scaffolding is a fancy word that goes back to the first point on the slide. We're helping them correctly conceptualize or scaffold the concepts, the knowledge, the skills that we want them to have. So some tips for being effective here as an instructor, make sure your cases and problems are clearly related to the content. It's very easy to make them too complicated, which is also going to make them developmentally inappropriate. So again, you want to make sure they're well-written and field test them with people who are close to the learners. So that may be colleagues who frequently teach this level of learner, that may be the learners just a year ahead of the learners that you're actually teaching, or if you're teaching, for example, uh, students rotating through your clinic in a third year type of rotation, uh, you can ask students who have already passed through to look at stuff if you're introducing something new for the subsequent rotations. Do anticipate where students are going to have questions. This is gonna help you be better at adapting in the moment. It's also going to help you go back and review the case and realize any sort of problem or activity you've given them may need more or less detail than you have originally planned. Also practice your worked answer to make sure that it's clear and post it someplace where the learners can independently access it and review it. Always make sure you pause to see if learners have questions. And so modeling that, again, I'm going to pause here, allow you to consolidate what's been discussed and jot down any questions you may have. And I'm going to continue on here. If you're not ready, please pause the recording and hit play when you're ready to go forward. So let's focus on some larger strategies on how to be successful if you choose to take the active learning route in your teaching. Avoid picking something that's too complex or something that you haven't taught many times previously. You also don't want to change too much within a lecture. So pick something you've done a lot or frequently that you're very comfortable teaching, 
change a few pieces of it the first time round and sit back and reflect on how that went before you wholesale change too much within that lecture or across multiple lectures that you're giving. Make sure that you teach, or sorry, make sure that you practice a lot what you're going to teach, especially if you've changed the format, especially if you're including activities now like worked problems or cases. Walk through them multiple times. Give yourself a week or a few days. Don't prepare just the night before. Make sure that you've field tested these activities. Make sure that you've worked through them yourself and you've anticipated where learners are going to have problems. Furthermore, how to be successful is prepare your learners for the new format, focusing on the third bullet down here. Tell them ahead of time, this is going to be new. It's going to feel different. Tell them what they are going to be expected to do so they know the parameters and always have that safety net of having the answer keys or lists. I also include for myself a timer just to keep me on track and a lesson plan that has a clear timeline to it. Make sure that you add on any evaluation of your teaching some sort of questions that will give you feedback about the format. Talk to whoever is in charge of distributing the evaluation and say, hey, I'd really like to add on a question of this was a new format. What worked for you about this format? Wording it in the positive then primes the learners to, to think about, okay, maybe not everything worked, but there were a few things today that were positive that um, I could give feedback on because trust me, they will fill in the negatives for you even when you ask the question in the positive. Another key point is make sure that you've talked to administration ahead of time. Uh, there are times that learners get very upset and they go above us to administration to complain. Uh, have, making sure that you have administrative support not only for your protected time and any sort of funds to create active learning uh, in your teaching, but also that there's that political support that yes, we have seen the data. These are good things to do to ensure better, higher quality learning for our students than merely lecturing and talking at them. Make sure that your administrators are willing to share that message with the students as well. So wrapping up, from this recording, you should take away that there's three easy strategies to incorporate active learning. You can pause, you can pause and ask questions, or you can pause and offer cases and problems. With the last two, always making sure to conceptually model for the learners the correct answer. I can't emphasize enough, it is really key for those of us teaching in higher education to prepare, anticipate, and practice, practice, practice. Always start small, and get feedback often and much. I wish you the best of luck with applying active learning in what you do. If you would like to email me, that email will be available with this recording. And I'd be happy to take your questions. Thanks so much and good luck.